Good morning. It's great to be with you today. I've had the opportunity on multiple occasions to explain humility to my young students. It is a wonderful thing for a child to be confident, but when that child makes everyone around him crazy for his overconfidence, sometimes I have to step in. To a first or second grader, humility means allowing others to say how good you are at something before you say it yourself. For us, today's definition of humility is setting aside your own self for the one who deserves all the glory. In today's reading from 2 Corinthians, Paul is extremely humble for the glory of God. He is surrounded by others who in commentaries have been called super apostles, who are preaching and sharing what they think is the truth, but in a way that Paul feels is more glorifying to them than to God. It's like they're trying to out-preach each other. This passage shows that there was a tenuous relationship between Paul and some of the Corinthians. The others said this about Paul in a previous chapter of this book. His letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Paul knows that he was being criticized for his manner rather than the content of what he was sharing. He writes, Let him who boasts boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Paul tells of an experience someone had, could it have been him, of what exactly scholars aren't clear, where he was caught up in the third heaven and told things that man is not permitted to tell. It's believed that Paul told this in an otherworldly way to show up what the others were saying, a bit of one-upmanship, that yes, you also talk about mystical experiences, but mine has the real truth in it. Contrary to the others who bring the glory on themselves, he brags on God for all he's done and all he is and gives the glory to him. Lest Paul lose any semblance of humility and become conceited, God strikes him with some sort of infirmity, the nature of which is unknown, that is a constant reminder of who the Almighty is and who deserves the glory. Paul begs God three times to remove this thorn, but is told that God's grace is sufficient and that his power is made perfect in weakness. If he were to just exist in this weakness and accept it, that's when Paul would see God's full glory. It's through Paul's humility and weakness that his focus remains on his God and that his ministry is made stronger. Do you believe that you approach God and rely on him more when you're at your weakest place? Do you lay all your worries and trials at his feet and leave them there for him to cover? When things go really well, do you give the glory to God or do you take the credit for yourself? This is a daily struggle that I have. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus returns to his hometown, Nazareth, and begins teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, no less. The townspeople don't give Jesus credence for all that he's attempting to teach them. How can they, after all? He's just the carpenter's boy, a worker, just like they are. Jesus knows what he's saying is the truth and that he has every right to say what he is and who he is and he calls himself prophet. This brings tension into the situation because, as writers Bruce Molina and Richard Rohrbra explain, honor was a limited good. If someone gained, someone else lost. To be recognized as a prophet in one's own town meant that honor due to another person or other families was diminished. Claims to more than one's appointed share of honor thus threatened others and would eventually trigger attempts to cut the claimant down to size. How many times have we read about Jesus stirring things up? This is yet another one. I can just imagine the townspeople saying to one another, who does this guy think he is? Little did they know. 
As we read in the Bible, Jesus was causing discomfort among those in the temples and must have realized over time receptivity by people to his words while spoken there were lessened. So he changed his strategy. Jesus' humble apostles are told to go share the good news with people, not in the temple, but in their homes. He gave them authority to say the words he was telling them to share, but they remained humble on their journey. No shoes, no extra clothes, no money, no bag. If they were turned away, just move on. When they visited people, if they were not welcome, they were told, shake the dust off your feet, which some might say was a judgment against the homeowners, as in, okay, we'll leave, but you're making a mistake. We're told that the apostles' mission was successful, but I guess that there were a lot of doors that were closed in their faces. Think of the various religious groups whose mission it is to visit people's homes to share their views. How many times have they shaken the dirt off their feet? How many times did the apostles? Did the challenges they faced force them to give them up to God? Did the weaknesses they felt make them more focused on their service to God? Imagine that you're being called to do something as were the apostles. What's your reaction? Mine is sometimes to turn away, change the subject, tell God that I can't for whatever reason. Something for you to ponder when faced with the call from Kierkegaard. It is very dangerous to go into eternity with possibilities which one has oneself prevented from becoming realities. A possibility is a hint from God. One must follow it. In every man there is a latent, the highest possibility. One must follow it. If God does not wish it, then let him prevent it. But one must not hinder oneself. Trusting to God, I have dared, but I was not successful. In that is to be found peace, calm, and confidence in God. I have not dared. That is a woeful thought, a torment in eternity. Today, as Sienna is baptized, her parents, grandparents, godparents, and all who love her look to the future, to the possibilities. May God nudge her into the direction that he desires, and may she follow him with humility and obedience. And for the rest of you, what hint is God giving you right now? What is the one regret you don't want to take with you to eternity? Think of the possibility that the apostles had to share the good news for Jesus. Imagine their lives had they turned the other way, changed the subject, or told Jesus they couldn't follow him for some reason. If you haven't had a nudge from God for a while, can you be humble enough to tell him that you're open for one? Think of the possibilities. Amen.